<laughs> the Johnson Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. Makers of Johnson's Wax, Johnson's Car New, and Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coat present Fibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn, with music by the King's Men and Billy Mills Orchestra. past few weeks, I've mentioned quite a few unusual uses for Johnson's Wax. As a matter of fact, I've been getting some very interesting letters passing along more of these helpful suggestions, and I intend to mention them from time to time. But today, I'd like to go back for just a moment to fundamentals and talk about the real number one purpose of Johnson's Wax, the principal reason for using it. It's protection, of course, protection for the finish of your floors, your tabletops, windowsills, yes, and your leather goods, refrigerator, and countless other things. The wax itself takes the wear. The finish underneath is safe. That's why in times like these, it's so important to keep your floors, furniture, and woodwork regularly waxed. After all, it does save you hours of work, too. And that's important right now for all of us. And it makes your entire home gleam and glow with protected beauty. Men do three things so badly they never fail to send their ever-loving wives into gales of scornful laughter. One, sew on buttons. Two, change the scenery on a baby. (laughs) And three, pack a suitcase. Get a load of number three as we meet Fibber McGee and Molly. Hey, Molly, did you leave this suitcase of mine in a damp place someplace? Why, of course not. Why? Well, it's shrunk. I can't get the stuff into it I used to get into. <laughs> Look, there's hardly room for my black shoes. Mm, so I see. Are you packing your tan shoes, too? I already got those in. Oh. Mm-hmm. Well, what are you going to wear on the train? Just your socks? Huh? Oh, my gosh. I packed both pair of shoes. Sure you did. did. Oh, well. It's just a short trip. I can wear my tennis shoes. <laughs> See, you never did tell me why we were taking this trip to Middleton. I got to see a friend of mine on some very important business. Now, let me see. I got my fishing tackle, my squirt gun. What? Why the squirt gun? That's in case we have to come home on a night train. I always get a berth above some guy that snores. (laughs) I'll see what else. Hey, you better get packed, Molly. We haven't got much time. Say, I've been packed for two hours, and I still don't know why. You know, I have a sneaking suspicion this trip is silly and unnecessary. What do you mean, unnecessary? I got to see a guy in Middleton that's home for a few days from Washington, and that may mean my whole future is at stake. Your future. Yeah. Let's just sit here and live in the past. (laughs) This is a necessary trip. This will affect the whole post-war travel industry of America. You don't say. I do indeed say. This is the correct... This is the greatest idea I ever had. In the years to come, the name of McGee is going to be anonymous with travel. No. You mean synonymous. I do not. Synonymous means moving pictures. (laughs) That's cinema. Huh? That's cinema. Horse feathers. Cinema is a spice that they never put enough of in apple pie. (laughs) No, that's cinnamon. Cinnamon? (laughs) I don't suppose you'd be thinking of those fish that swim up the Columbia River every year to pawn their young. You mean salmon and you mean spawn, and I'm not thinking any such thing. Well, then, doggone it, what's anonymous? Anonymous means without a name. Exactly. Only now it's got a name, and the name is McGee. The McGee system of world travel. Well, by an odd coincidence, my name is McGee, too. So would you mind breaking to me uh, gently, of course? Why, it's very simple. Just buy up a couple of old aircraft carriers, get a few planes and some good pilots, and whammo. I can land tourists anywhere in the world without even docking the boat. You get it? 
Well, heavenly days, you've actually got an idea there, Jimmy. Why, of course I have. It's going to revolutionize travel. <laughs> That's why this trip is so important. This is government business. Have we got time to have a little lunch? No, we'll eat on the train. Oh. They say the dining cars are so crowded and so short of help now, it's hard to get anything to yeah. eat, so... I'm putting up a little box lunch for us. Oh, that's swell. Just like old times. Sure. You know, I feel guilty about uh, going on this trip, McGee. What do you mean, guilty? Well, we shouldn't travel unnecessarily now. And if I stay home, that's one more seat for a soldier sailor. You oh, know? what do they got to do that's as important as what I got to do? Oh, just win the war is all. Nothing urgent. Oh, well. <laughs> A couple of seats on a train ain't going to lose the war. Come on, get your grip and we'll get over Look, there. Look, McGee, why can't you do your business by mail or even by telegram? Because this is a thing where I got a pound on a guy's desk and shout at him. You can't do that in all that. <laughs> oh, for the love of you. We never started any place yet that we didn't have a few dear, dear friends drop in for a lovely, lovely chat. Yeah. And the way they keep coming back after we brush them off, you'd think they were lint and we were blue surge. Yeah. Come in. <laughs> Hello, Mrs. D. Hello, Mr. McGee. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Wimple. Hi, Wimp, old man. I haven't got much time to bat the fat with you on account of we're grabbing the iron horse for Middleton in a few minutes. Little business trip. Really? Mm-hmm. Well, I may see you at the station then, folks. Oh. I'm going to meet a few trains. Oh. Sweetie Face has been away on a trip, you know. Oh. oh, what time is she coming in, Mr. Wimple? Friday at 4.30. Well, then what you meeting today's trains for? Oh, I just thought it would be fun to see some trains come in that didn't have Sweetie Face on them. (laughs) She sent me a postcard and said the trains were so crowded it was no fun traveling now. No, I guess not, Wimp. Between the Army and the Navy and the civilians, the railroads have bitten off about as much as they can (laughs) choo-choo. If you get what I mean, and you should, because that's one of my simpler jokes. Uh, Say, uh, where's your wife been, Miss Wimple? She went to one of the Eastern Army camps, Mrs. McGee, oh. for a two-week special commando training course. Oh. <laughs> She's learning 43 new ways to kill a man. New ways? Yes. She knew 57 before she left <laughs> and wanted to make it an even 100. <laughs> She's been gone 10 days now. Heavenly days. Yes. Ten heavenly days. <laughs> Personally, Wimp, I'd be a touch twitchy about living with a wife that could bump me off in a hundred different ways. Oh, I'm not afraid, Mr. McGee. <laughs> I have a few little tricks of my own. Such as what, Mr. Wimple? Oh, such as hiding a little bottle of nitroglycerin. Hiding it where? <laughs> in her punching bag. <laughs> well, I'll probably see you at the station. Goodbye now. Folks. So long, Wimp. such a busy place? Did you ever see so many lads in uniform? Every bench is full of them. Yeah, and they're all looking very thoughtful, too. (laughs) This must be the army of preoccupation. (laughs) 
<laughs> you get it, Molly? Thoughtful, preoccupation. It's a play on words. Ain't isn't funny, it? McGee. <laughs> Ain't, huh? I gave Bob Hope three jokes about she was so fat that and trade for her, too. <laughs> By the way, did you make reservations for Middleton, dearie? They wouldn't make any reservations. Said everything was full up. Our only chance is for somebody to make a cancellation. Well, I told you we had no business traveling anywhere these days. Uh... Citizens ought to sit and let the troops have the trips. Yeah, but I tell you, this is important stuff. The McGee system of post-war travel is one of the greatest ideas... Well, anybody... hello there, kids. Gone someplace? Hello, Miss <laughs> Yes, uh, McGee is going to see a man in Middleton about promoting an idea. Fellow from Washington, old-timer. He's a big man down there. Is that so? I got a cousin down in Washington, Johnny. He's a bureaucrat. <laughs> no, you mean b- bureaucrat. No, bureaucrat. Huh? He creates bureaus for people that got no place to put their furniture. <laughs> Washington's pretty crowded now, kid. Well, if this idea of mine goes the way I think it will, we'll most likely move into the White House, old-timer. Yeah, and if it goes the way your ideas usually go, we'll move into the doghouse. <laughs> anyway, if Washington is too crowded, I'll move my headquarters to New York. Getting kind of ahead of yourself, ain't you, Johnny? Huh? It's always been a big job for you to move your hindquarters. <laughs> Is that so? Well, let me tell you, old Now, man. take it easy, McGee. Well. And you better be doing something about tickets or we won't go anyplace, which will be all right with me. Well, I won't keep you kids any longer. But if you'll take my advice, you'll get onto the streetcar and go home. Oh, yeah? Yes, yeah, sir. Look at all them boys in uniform. Bad enough for them to be fighting Japs and Germans without having to fight Americans for a seat in a train. Take it over, Johnny. <laughs> Why, that nosy old grave digger. Here I am with the most important government project of the century. Well, I think and... he's right, McGee. Your idea may be good, but it's not a government project. Well, neither was the war till it was forced onto us. And this idea of mine is going to be the Pearl Harbor of transportation. It's going to wake people up. It's going to... Hey, let's get to the information desk while we got a chance. All right, I'll go with you and help you think up some funny questions. Hi, sis. What about trains to Middleton? Yes. Yes what, dearie? Yes, there are trains to Middleton. Oh, gun it, I know there's trains to Middleton, but when? 1.32 a.m., 4.27 a.m., 8.50 a.m., 11 a.m., 2.56 a.m., 6.18 a.m. PM at midnight. Do you like to travel with the cream of society? Absolutely, sis. Then I'd suggest the Jersey Special at 4.27 a.m. That's the milk train. <laughs> Is it uh, true that the trains are pretty crowded right now, dearie? Yes, madam. But you must realize that space for civilian travel is necessarily restricted because of troop movements and war business. Well, this is a fine state of how do you do. Who's in charge of transportation for the government anyway? I'm going to write that guy a dirty letter. Mr. Joseph B. Eastman. Oh, he'll help us. We've been using one of his cameras for years. (laughs) Splendid. I'm sure he'll send you one of his best negatives. Excuse me, please. Yes. Well... Looks like we'd be eating our box lunch right here in the station. Maybe. It's an outrage, that's what it is. My gosh, you'd think we were asking for a special train on a private track with a crew of cover girls. All we want is a seat on one of their sooty old bone shakers. You're being slightly unreasonable, dearie. Unreasonable, my clavicle. Is it unreasonable? <laughs> is it unreasonable to want to go a mere 250 miles to transact some legitimate business? Certainly not, sweetheart. Well... What if some soldier sailor does have to spend his 10-day furlough in a railroad station? Because some civilians grabbed all the accommodations. Oh, well. Maybe they like railroad stations. Uh, they can have fun playing red cap as long as they're left holding the bag anyway. Well, you wait till the McGee system of transportation well, is hello off. there, folks. Where are you bound for? Hello, Mr. Wilcox. Hi, Junior. Do you smell something burning? No, what's burning? I am. <laughs> he wants to go see a man in Middleton on business, Mr. Wilcox, and there's no space on the train. Yeah. Well, what might even think there would be? You heard about the war, pal? Huh? You see, it all started when the Japs smacked us at Pearl Harbor. And then... it, of course I know about the war. Well, then you ought to know better than to try to travel on trains these days, pal. They've got all they can handle with soldiers and sailors and government employees and military supplies. I'm practically a government official myself, Wilcox. Or I will be as soon as they take a gander at my new transportation system. Yeah. to go see a man in Middleton on business, Mr. Wilcox, and there's no space on the train. Yeah. Well, what might even think there would be? You heard about the war, pal? Huh? You see, it all started when the Japs smacked us at Pearl Harbor, Doc, and then... Of course I know about the war. 
Well, then you ought to know better than to try to travel on trains these days, pal. They've got all they can handle with soldiers and sailors and government employees and military supplies. I'm practically a government official myself, Wilcox. Or I will be as soon as they take a gander at my two new transportation system. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Wilcox, he won't be happy till he gets that system out of his briefcase. <laughs> or gets that briefcase out of his system, either one. Well, well, take it easy, friend. These days, railroads are like a kitchen linoleum. Oh, my gosh, there he goes. <laughs> when they have to handle too much traffic, something has to be done about it. Now, with the railroads, they have to cut down on traveling. With linoleum, the best treatment is Johnson's self-polishing glow coat. You ever have a shoe come off in your hand, dragging them in by the heels like that? <laughs> Protection, that's the answer. The railroads have to protect themselves against breakdowns and overloading by persuading people not to travel unnecessarily. Just like linoleum is protected against wear and dampness and grinding dirt particles by Johnson's glow coat. And I'll bet the railroads wish they had some system of protection as easy to use as glow coat that they could just apply and let dry and have the whole job done in 20 minutes or less. Say, what are you doing down here at the railroad station, Mr. Wilcox? Well, I was waiting for somebody. Who? You. What do you want to see McGee about? I had a message for him. Well, give it to me. What was the message? Oh, the usual one about Johnson's glow coat. I just gave it to you. So long now. <laughs> So he follows you all over town just to tell you about Johnson's products, series. Yeah, I know, I know. He keeps hoping he'll floor me, and the minute he does, I'll be glow-coated from scalp to scupper. <laughs> I sometimes think he'd... Look, McGee, here's your chance to get to the ticket window. Huh? Oh, oh, come on, hurry, man. Hi, bud. Thank Hi. you. Uh, Middleton, sir. Sorry, sold out. Uh, but look, bud, this is a very important uh, government business. I'm... Oh, I'm... don't give me that government business business, brother. I've heard all the switches on that gag. Yeah, but if you have any cancellations on the train to Middleton... If I do, lady, you're number 739 in line for them. Why don't you go home and bake a cherry pie? Don't you talk that way to my wife, you big rubber stamp wrestler. You keep a civil tongue between your teeth while you still got teeth. I got a good note Move to... Move along, let... please. Next... Oh. Well, personally, McGee, I'm convinced. Well, I'm not. I got a legitimate reason for traveling. And by the cast-iron cow-catcher of Casey Jones, I'm going to get to... Uh Uh-oh, McGee, here comes Mrs. Uppington. Oh, fine. That's all I needed. (laughs) One look at that prune puss old powder pigeon, and I'm as happy as a flea in a fox farm. In fact, superannuated old water spot... Hush, hush. I'll admit she's a nuisance. Ah, hello there, Abigail, darling. It's so nice. Uh, how do you do, Mr. McGee? And Mr. McGee? Hi. <laughs> what on earth is the matter with you, Mr. McGee? Or perhaps you're having the same difficulty I am. Well, he's got his nose out of joint because he can't get a seat on a train, Abigail. It's ridiculous, that's what it is. Keeping a businessman off the train when he's got the greatest transportation idea of the century in his briefcase, and he can... Hey, where's my briefcase? Uh, under your arm, uh, Mr. McGee. Where? Which arm? Your left arm. Huh? No, the other one. Oh. Oh, yeah. I think there's spies around here, Molly. I'd have swore I had this briefcase under the other arm. Uh, Are you traveling with important documents, Mr. McGee? Well, he isn't exactly traveling, Abigail, but he has a pretty good idea in that briefcase. What do you mean, pretty good? Look, Uppy, you've done a lot of traveling, haven't you? Oh, I have indeed, Mr. McGee. I have circumnavigated the globe three times. Not only that, but she took a trip around the world once, too, McGee. (laughs) Well, then you ought to be a judge, Uppy. Look, what if you could get on a boat in New York, sail for two days, hop in an airplane, and land anywhere you wanted to in Europe inside of six or eight hours? Well, why not take an airplane in the first place? I imagine after the war, the clippers will go almost everywhere. Heavenly days, I never thought of that. Ah, but I did. With the McGee system, Uppy, you don't have to depend on regular schedules, see? Make up your mind at the last minute and go any place you want to in practically your own private plane. He's got the idea all worked out, and he wants to go see a man from Washington who's in Middleton, Abigail. Yes, and I can't get a seat on one of their flat-wheeled old cinder buckets. <laughs> Imagine that. Me, the greatest brain in the transportation industry. Ain't that a laugh? I think it's splendid. Huh? Why, Abigail? Mrs. McGee, I came down here to meet my nephew, who is in the Marines. Huh? He had five days' liberty before leaving the country. And what happened? What happened? I just received a wire that he had to go back to camp because there was no room on the train. And why? Because selfish, unthinking, me for civilians have taken all the extra space. So don't complain to me about your petty troubles, Mr. McGee. 
If you insist on being bullheaded, why don't you take a cattle car? Goodbye. <laughs> King's men sing in my arms. His cousin had sent him a sweater, and his sister wrote a letter. But he wanted something much better, this boy who was sailing away. For his buddies were there with their sweethearts, all around him with their sweethearts. Now he never had any sweethearts, and over and over he'd say. to get a girl in my arms, in my arms, in my arms, ain't I never gonna get a bundle of charm, come to dawn, I'll be gone, I just gotta have a honey holding me tight, you can't keep your knitting and your purling if I'm gonna go to Berlin, give me a girl in my arms tonight, in my arms, in my arms, ain't I never gonna get a girl in my arms, in my arms, in my arms. legitimate business to transact somebody with. Can't even get a seat on a train. It's a dirty imposition. Pushed around like a hobnailed peasant. It's discriminatory, that's what it is. I'm a patient man, but by George... Oh, stop your grousing, McGee. Well, gee whiz. Anybody think this war was a plot against you personally? Well... The railroads now are for soldiers and sailors who want to go places and do things. Not for people like us who just want to go places. Well, my gosh, I don't... You asked the man about the cancellations? Yes, and all I got was an evasive answer. Told me to go stuff an ostrich. <laughs> I got a good notion. Oh, oh, there's Doc Gamble. Hi, Doc. Hello there, McGee. Hello, Mrs. McGee. Meeting somebody? No, Doctor. We're trying to get a seat on the train to Middleton without any spectacular success so far. Is it a matter of life and death that you go to Middleton? Well, no, but gee... And why don't you stay home? But you see, Doctor... McGee... All I can see is a lot of home-hating hobos with more money than cents... Cluttering up the country's transportation system with their little penny ante projects and their fishing trip. Huh? A lot of short-sighted stoops with ants in their itineraries. <laughs> yeah, but look, Doc, I got a very important hunk of business to transact a guy with. It'll mean a great deal to this government after the war. It ain't right that I'm being kept off a train just because a lot of other people haven't got sense enough to stay home. Is it? Take off your shirt, McGee. <laughs> Gee. There you go again. Take off your shirt. Take off. What for? Just for a gag. I want to stuff it in your mouth to keep you from talking about how important you are. <laughs> Why, when I see self-inflated little big shots keeping servicemen from getting seats on trains, keeping them from seeing their families before they go someplace to save the country for people like you, it gives the Darwinian theory a beautiful new meaning. We've certainly descended from monkeys. Good day. <laughs> What's a Darwinian theater got to do with monkeys? You know, I'd hate to be a doctor and understand people as well as he does. Yeah. What a bedside manner. <laughs> Take a crab apple a day to keep that doctor away. <laughs> Better stand to one side, McGee. A train just came in. We'll get trampled in the rush. Boy, look at him. Hurrying and scurrying like a swarm of... Oh, my gosh, there's Don Stauffer. Who's Don Stauffer? He's the guy from Washington. I was going to go to Middleton to see about my idea. 
Hey, Don. Hey. Oh, hello there, McGee. Glad to see you. Molly, this is Mr. Stoffer. Stoffy, old man, with my wife. How do you do, I'm sure. How do you do? Sorry I can't stop and talk, McGee. Have an appointment in ten minutes. Uh, but look, I got the most wonderful idea, uh, Don. Write but... me a letter about it. I'm working on a very important project right now. Something secret? Well, not necessarily. We're thinking of buying up all aircraft carriers after the war and using them for ocean tourist travel. Carry a lot of small planes to land people anywhere in the world in just a few hours. <laughs> well, nice to have seen you, McGee. <laughs> Hope we'll meet again, Mrs. McGee. If you'll excuse me now, I'll just... Oh, well, how do you like that? They stole my idea. They picked my brain. Oh, they... no, they didn't either, dearie. Somebody else was bound to think of it. Huh? After all, there are other people in the world that are just as smart as you are. Yeah, I suppose they are. <laughs> Gee whiz, I had a swallow. Hey, McGee, I'm all worn out with all this stand around. Let's sit down on the bench and open up the lunch. All right. It's so late that we'll have Oh, to... my gosh, Molly, the lunch. Look. Look where? That guy over there, he's eating our lunch right out of a shoebox. I'll fix him. But, McGee, you must... Hey, you, you big lunch napper. What do you think you're doing? That's the problem. Have the book I stabbed the for the... Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my a likely story. You got a lot of nerve grabbing our lunch. Now, McGee, please. Doggone it, if he was that hungry, I'd have bought him a sandwich. You put that box down, you pickle thief, or I'll dribble your skull around the station like a basketball. Perhaps you come and grab his basket trap, you must go never from the grab the gift. Who puts his come out of the board of the duck together? Never. McGee, leave him alone. He's a foreigner. He doesn't understand, and besides Besides that... nothing. I'll teach him to sabotage our sandwiches. Drop that grub, bub, and I'll give you a lesson in the manly art of assault and battery. Come on, I'll see you. You're going to get my grub. 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 Hey. Hey, come back here, you. You just come back here and I'll beat up a junior out of you. Now, let him go, McGee. He's dropped the lunch. Here. He hardly touched it. Poor fellow was scared to death. Ah. Now sit down and calm yourself. Okay. Let me take a sandwich. Help yourself. Hmm, this looks good. Garlic sausage on rye bread. I'll have one. What? Garlic sausage on rye bread. Yeah. Want a bite? It's wonderful. Mm. You sure put up a swell lunch, baby. I could eat a sitting McGee, here. McGee. Huh? This isn't our lunch. Huh? I just remembered I left ours in the taxi cab. You, you, you mean that guy wasn't? He he didn't. Uh, I shouldn't. You hadn't. Oh, sure. <laughs> There are thousands of cars on the road right now that badly need a spring cleanup. Not just for beauty's sake, though it's a lot more fun driving a clean, shining automobile than one that's dull and gloomy looking. No, for a more important reason. If you don't remove that winter scum, it may damage the finish permanently. It may contain salt or other chemicals used on the winter highways. Your only safe procedure is to clean the finish thoroughly, but with a safe cleaner, one that doesn't injure the finish. Preferably one that both cleans and polishes with a single application. Yes, I mean Johnson's Car New, the double-purpose cleaner and polish made by the makers of Johnson's Wax. Car New is an easy-to-use liquid. Apply it, it dries to a white powder. You wipe off the powder. Ask any Car New user for his opinion. You'll be willing to spring clean your own car, because with Johnson's Car New, the job is relatively easy. Ladies and gentlemen, when you have sons and brothers, yes, and sisters and daughters in the service, it's nice to have them come home when and if they can. And it's heartening to know that the railroads of this country are doing a tremendous job of transporting essential military and civilian supplies. So let's not get in their way. Let's not do any traveling that isn't absolutely necessary. That's right. The fish will still be biting and the scenery will still be here after the war. So let's all pack our suitcases back in the closet. Good night. Good night, all. The characters of Wallace Wimple and the Old Timer heard on our program were played by Bill Thompson. This is Harlow Wilcox, speaking for the makers of Johnson Wax Finishes for Home and Industry, inviting you all to join us again next Tuesday night. Good night. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company.
Chicago WMAQ.